Partners, entitled Accountable Care, Growth, and Complexity of the Movement. My name is Andrew Crowshaw. I'm a partner here at Levitt Partners and uh, will be moderating today's discussion. I'm also pleased to have Tom Merrill, my colleague and, uh, and the person who acts as Senior Director of our ACO Research. He'll be doing some of the presenting of our uh, content and insights today. We're also very pleased to have another colleague of ours with us, Charlene Frazera. Charlene is the former Acting Administrator at the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Studies and is a, a thought leader who continues to be accessed for her insights on the evolution of health reform. Tom and Charlene, let me just do a sound check. Are you both hearing me? Loud and clear, Andrew. Great. And Charlene? Yes, I can hear you. Thank you. Terrific. So Levitt, for some of you on the phone today, Levitt Partners will be a new organization. Levitt Partners is a health intelligence firm. We pr provide data and predictive insights to operating healthcare companies, to states, to investors, associations, foundations, and other groups who are looking to develop the best possible picture of where healthcare is going. We organize our research into various groups. We have a group focusing on the health insurance exchange movement and on the regulation of the health insurance industry. We're looking at the growth in Medicaid uh, transitions, the expansion questions, dual eligible populations. And the Center for Accountable Care uh, is our team that focuses on the movement towards uh, more, not surprisingly, accountability in, in care. And that's the group who will be presenting today. Just a couple of quick uh, instructions on how this webinar works. Because of the large number of participants, we're not going to be using the raise hand feature. Everyone will be muted, but we invite you to interact with us through the chat feature that you should see in the bottom right-hand corner of the webinar. Throughout the presentation, you can submit a, a question through that chat feature at any time, and we'll respond to as many of those questions as we can, uh, especially at the back half of this presentation. So with that in mind, I'm excited because I can guarantee you you're going to see some data today that you haven't seen anywhere else. We're going to start with a, a little bit of a backdrop of the election outcomes um, and, the, and the fiscal situation facing our country. And then we're going to jump into some trends that we're seeing in the ACO uh, movement itself, uh, talk about the spectrum of payment arrangements and what structures are supporting those payment arrangements, and then finish with some competencies that are important to the ACO growth based on the work that we're doing. So um, moving along, um, you know, it's been, it's, uh, it's interesting, the term ACO is, um, it's a new part of the healthcare lexicon and it's been a source of mystery and confusion uh, to many. So to be helpful, we just want to make sure you're in the right place. If you're looking for the American Cornhole Organization webinar, the Aloha Cable Observatory webinar, the Ant Colony Optimization, or any of the other ACO type of um, organizations that our Google Alert catches for us, then you're in the wrong place. But if you're here to understand more about the accountable care movement, then we're happy to have you and delighted to share some insights. With that, Charlene, let me just turn to you for some perspective on what we learned this week in the election and what we see happening in the months to follow and how that's going to impact this movement. Yeah, thank you, Andrew. So um, I will say, you know, people woke up um, Wednesday morning and while many didn't like the results of the election, I think there is some comfort that the um, election turned out the way it did. So basically, I think people are saying things stayed the same. The White House, the House, and the Senate basically stayed in control of the parties that originally had them. I think the one um, difference is that people do believe that the House has some, um, some of the GOP moderates have left that, um, that caucus and that they have more, um, con more um, conservative people in the House. So, you know, we really believe that while the majorities have stayed the same, that the Republicans will have a much more conservative approach than they did before, and that the Democrats have three much more liberal um, 
congressman. So, you know, I think it'll be interesting. I think people said it'll be the same, but I think there are some tweaks to, to the balance of power that will make it not quite the same. Um, so, you know, the, uh, the idea of coming up with compromise is a little more complicated than I think people thought. So as you see from this, from this slide here, 191 Democrats in the House, three of them leaning more to the left. 232 Republicans, nine more leaning to the conservative side. So that will bring more balance of power to the, the um, conservatives and the Republicans, and we'll see how that compromise plays out. As you'll see on the next slide, the Senate, I think people have less, it, it does look more like it used to, um, 53 Democrats, 47 Republicans with two independents. Um, and I think people think that's generally, you know, most of the people in power in the Senate stay the same so that the agenda and um, positions will remain basically the same, unlike the House where there may be some tweaking. So on the next slide, so that's basically how we think the election um, fell out and things to look for in terms of changes in the compromises being made in, in um, Washington these days. So on the next slide, what you'll see, what we're really concerned about is what are the economics that will force change? So, you know, lots of people will say, well, they can't come to compromise, they're not going to agree. And I think most, everybody in Washington agrees that it is not acceptable any longer for that to happen and that really it can't. So I think for the first time in history, people realize that major change has to happen because of economics versus change has to happen because we think we can do things differently and better. So you can see here the economics that are going to force the change, right? So Social Security, the entitlement programs are all really going to be big economic forces in the change, and these are all things that passed um, up through ACA, which happened in 2008. You'll see those forces happening, and then as you see ACA implementation in 2012 moving forward, you can see how those lines continue to grow, that the economic forces are going to continue to force change over and above the need to change just to change because people think that that's a better place for the economy, for, for the country to be. And then the next slide, we talk a little bit about the healthcare debate on the shift to the fiscal cliff. So I think this picture is so appropriate. And I believe that's really how most people in Washington feel today. I mean, I feel like they really believe they're sitting on the, in that Jeep, just looking over the edge with no real safety ladders, you know, nothing to help them down that cliff easily. So I think there's just, you know, lots and lots and lots of um, concern in Washington. How are we going to get to the bottom of the cliff without just falling over and, you know, crash and burning? So they're really trying to figure out ways to build some safety letters off the cliff or some ideas to get us from the beginning to the end without crashing. Having said that, I think sequestration is probably the easiest thing to happen in many ways. Um, you know, that's a pretty well laid out plan. There are some tweaks around the edges, but, you know, they've laid out a plan on where they think the money is going to come from. And lots of people in Washington say, well, if you let the sequestration happen, at least we know what's going to happen, and it's a pretty clear path to um, fixing the, the fiscal cliff. Others, though, feel, and I think most people in Washington believe that that's not going to happen. They will not let the sequestration take effect. The big question is, how long will it take them to come to some compromise, and what will those compromises be? And what's even more interesting is different industries have different views of whether they want sequestration to happen or whether they want, in fact, some compromise around the fiscal cliff. So, you know, some of it's the devil is in the details, and what you don't know makes you more afraid than what you do. So. People are hoping that the fiscal cliff, um, there will be some compromise, at least the, the politicians in Washington hope for a compromise for the sequestration instead of a straight 2% uh, cut. However, having said that, as we talked about just a few minutes ago, you know, the balance of power in the Republicans, while they still have the balance of power, we just believe that there are some in there who are going to dig their heels in maybe a little bit deeper than they did before. So, you know, the ability to make a compromise makes it a little bit more difficult. I think, you know, the bigger, the bigger question in Washington is how long will it take to come up with a compromise or how long will they push this off and deal um, with it in, in a more responsible way. So I would say half of the people in Washington say it's going to take six months, that they will um, 
give a six-month extension to sequestration and deal with that and try to get it resolved in a six-month period. I think the other half think it's probably going to take a year. Now, that's easy to say. I think, you know, the, uh, the other unknown in this whole discussion is the economy. So if the economy goes into recession, will that cause them to have to deal with the fiscal cliff sooner than they really are comfortable? If the economy recovers, will that give them some comfort that they can hold it off a little bit longer? So, you know, in, we like to say that the knowns um, in healthcare, I think here we're giving you, there are some knowns, but I think the bottom line message to this is there are probably more unknowns in the fiscal cliff debate than there are knowns at this point in time. Charlene, uh, let me just ask, you know, we, we know that there were some specific instructions to CMS in the Affordable Care Act that referred to enabling ACOs to work. Do you see some of those components of the bill at risk in this whole fiscal cliff debate that we're going to see unfold in the coming months? So that's a great question. So I think it's interesting that if you looked at sequestration, it really talks more about cutting provider reimbursement rates, and it just basically says we're going to take 2% out of Medicare. I think most people, when that originally came out, just figured, well, they would take those out of the hides of providers in the fee-for-service world, some out of managed care. I don't know that they really thought that much about the ACO dynamics and how many of those have been created. So my, I, I think they would like to not take it out of the ACOs. I think CMS would love to protect those ACOs as much as they possibly can because in their view, that's the future to spending less on health care by providing better coordinated care through the ACOs. So, you know, and the folks I've talked to, it, they feel it's counterintuitive to cut reimbursement rates from the one place in the reimbursement system that you think you're actually going to have some success in reducing costs and improving quality of care. So they will try as hard as they can not to impact the ACOs in that sequestration. Thank you, Charlene. And I'm, I'm picking up a question that's been submitted by an attendee here. What kind of numbers growth are you anticipating in the next round of government-sponsored ACOs? I know that's not a number that's been publicly put out there, but are we hearing any whispers about that? Yeah, so I think um, now that the Democrats are back in power, I, I, the rumors that I hear, and again, this is not official, um, that they are going to try to put as much into the next round of ACOs as they did this first round. I think they feel so much more comfortable in the ACO environment now than they did in the beginning. I think if you saw the evolution of ACOs, it started out with a very regulated um, program, which re CMS realized they had to be more flexible in, which then turned to the pioneer ACOs, which now has really developed into an industry where there are all kinds of ACOs across the country that don't really meet the federal requirements. But I think the federal government really does see some huge advantages in some of those ACO-like industries. So I know they really want to get as much money if they possibly could in the next fiscal um, year as they did the last year. Again, whether they'll be able to do that in turn because of the dynamics in, in Washington is a little hard to say. Thank you. So Charlene, uh, it sounds like you're saying this movement continues. Uh, there will be some modifications. There will be a lot of carnage that's happening all around, possibly even in healthcare. But is it safe to say that this is complementary to the objectives of finding savings uh, generally, but, but also in healthcare? Definitely. And you know, the, the way I'll summarize that in the end, you know, if you look at healthcare today from the CMS world, they have three buckets of, of, of service. They have fee for service, they have managed care, and then they have the coordinated ACO market. You know, they def nobody likes the fee-for-service market. Everybody knows that has to be changed. Utilization, you can't just pay for utilization. So they're trying to refine that market. They haven't been big fans of managed care. And, you know, while managed care continues to survive, they see some issues around that delivery system. Their hope is really on what health reform legislation does, building this new, better model, which does a much better job of coordinating care, reducing costs, and providing better health to beneficiaries. So from their perspective, that's where all of their hope really is. It's not really on tweaking the current systems. It's trying to develop this new model that you know, just provides better delivery and at less cost. Thank you. 
Well, let's shift now, and uh, I'm, I'm going to turn the time to my colleague Tom to w begin to walk us through some of the research that we're pulling together on trends in ACL growth and dispersion. Tom. Thanks, Andrew. Um, as was mentioned before, uh, my name is Tom Merrill. I head up the uh, largely the research efforts that uh, are, under, are uh, ongoing here at Levitt Partners, and I wanted to just give a, a quick overview of some of the way we work internally and, and speak to specifically two efforts that are uh, about to come out. <clears throat> when you look at this first slide, uh, we, we sort of categorize our efforts into four, uh, sort of four levels. One is the, sort of the secondary research in which we're engaged where we're actively tracking 300 plus ACOs all over the country. That's ACOs involved in public programs and private programs and those involved in both. Secondly, we are engaging uh, ACOs uh, directly, and we've, uh, to this date, uh, conducted more than 70 interviews, and that has yielded some really good primary research. And uh, third, on, a, on the next level, we take that research and sort of take it to uh, uh, our, our people like Charlene Frazera, among others, and we analyze this stuff. Uh, and on the fourth level, we're realizing that a lot of the, this, this data um, needs to be put into a context, and we're doing some market-level research as we speak. So. Um, two specific efforts uh, that I wanted to just call out uh, for the purpose of this webinar is that we will be referring to data from two different data sets. One is a, uh, a research effort in, uh, that we partnered with KLAS on. They are a uh, research organization who has uh, specific competencies regarding HIT. We felt like it was a great partnership to engage these organizations, and we interviewed 60 there, and so we, we'll, we'll call that out when we present data from that sample. And then there will also be other uh, instances in which we're presenting data from our what we call our census, and that is basically all the ACOs that are on our radar at this point. So um, one thing that would be helpful before we go on, and we won't uh, dilate much on this, but it's uh, it's uh, sort of reference some of the qualitative findings that we're, uh, we're um, uh, encountering through our engagement with these ACOs. And that is, no matter what the maturity is of a given ACO, no matter where they are in the maturity spectrum, uh, they all have really similar goals. And they're falling under this structure that you see here on the slide. One is that, uh, again, despite whether it's a little risk or a lot of risk, uh, most ACO leaders were, were engaging say that their organization has to bear more financial risk for their population or some if they currently are bearing none and that they have to align those incentives internally. On um, the next level, those, that sort of financial alignment leads to, um, uh, sort of leads them to necessarily uh, put in place processes that, that allow them to manage a population and as you can see here, uh, to invest and learn to use appropriate IT. And all of this, they're very aware, is uh, in, uh, in order to help them produce measured outcomes, specifically improving the patient experience, improving population health, and reducing the cost of care for populations. Um, th these are this is sort of a snapshot of the numbers as they are right now at this at this particular moment, and uh, uh, we thought it would be beneficial to at least uh, define what we mean by sponsoring entity. Uh, uh, this does not mean the organization that is necessarily calling the shots, but this is the organization that has, at least in our uh, opinion, uh, initiated the ACO arrangement. And so you have here um, uh, what was reflected in our last report, and that is that uh, hospital systems are the majority, followed by physician groups and, uh, and, and insurers and community-based organizations and last. Uh, also, that uh, something that will help out with the rest of this webinar is to uh, quickly go over what we mean by ACO type. This is something that uh, we've noticed has been picked up by the industry, uh, and we're grateful for that, but we developed it internally as a way to simply understand this movement better for our own purposes. Um, you've heard the phrase, if you've seen one ACO, you've seen one ACO. Well, we disagree with that a little bit. We think that there are roughly four categories of ACOs, uh, and, we, and you can categorize them by their partnerships. And the first one is where an insurer will come in, and this is, uh, Aetna would be a good example, where they come in and they completely wrap around a provider group or a provider and enable them to be more accountable. The second is where an insurer and a provider 
really are partners in this effort and they both are going above and beyond industry expectation. The third category is single provider. Um, uh, this is an Intermountain, a Cleveland Clinic, a Kaiser, where they have all the pieces and really it's just an internal transition to become more accountable. The fourth category is multiple provider ACO, which is probably what most thought would be the more common uh, organization. That is where you have the multiple non-known entities participating together. So Tom, let me just ask a question on this. So if you're a community-based hospital with a, a network of physicians that you either own or contract with, what type of ACO are you? I mean, you're, you're, not, a, you're not necessarily an integrated health system, um, but are you a single provider ACO in, that, in, that, uh, in those terms? Uh, it really it depends on the structure. How are those physicians affiliated or owned? I think you said that they were affiliated. If they are a completely different entity, uh, even though there's that close affiliation beforehand, we would we would consider them a multiple, multiple provider. provider. Mm -hmm. Okay. Great question. Thanks. Um, so here are the numbers uh, broken out by the category. Um, you'll notice that uh, what most people thought would be the more common uh, model is not the more common model, and I, I think it should be apparent why single providers were able to quickly announce that they had all the pieces in place and that this was simply uh, uh, a rebranding of what they've already been doing or an internal, a small internal transition. So here are some numbers that uh, are going to be new to everyone on the call. Um, and in fact, we'll be releasing more in the future. We'll be releasing quarter four, but this goes up to quarter three. And this is basically by quarter the amount of ACOs that we have that have been on our radar. But we think is pretty indicative of the ACO movement in general. And you can see that that trend line is definitely going up. But this doesn't tell the whole story. Uh, if you were to dive in, you'll notice that uh, hospital systems is represented by the red line. Uh, represents the majority from the beginning, which we classify as the first wave of ACOs. But if you look at IPA or physician groups as represented by the blue line, yes, they're uh, not as uh, uh, numerous, but if you see towards quarter one and quarter two of this year, there's a sharp increase. And there's a few explanations for that. One is uh, CMS, uh, their second um, uh, uh, contingency of ACOs had much more of a physician group focus. Um, but this also includes Aetna and some of the things that they're doing um, wrapping around physician. Tom, let me just ask, the previous slide you showed was a the overall trajectory, and I mean, it's clearly an accelerating trend, but then you look at what's driving the acceleration here, and, it, and it's, it's hospitals, but it's even more so IPAs or physician groups are accelerating at a, at a quicker pace. I'm a little bit surprised to see the insurer participation growing, but at a, at a much more modest clip. How do you interpret that? Uh, so that's probably not super representative of what the the ACO involvement. What we're looking at here is the ACO sponsors. Now, ideally, in every ACO, there is a payer prov uh, a payer partner. Now, in some cases, it's an, uh, at no uh, playing a role of an ASO or or a, a regional insurer playing that role. Um, they're obviously involved, but in terms of actually leading each initiative. It's been slow and steady growth, and we, we feel like we captured the insurer involvement in other places. Okay. So that, I, I think that is important for our participants that we may there may be evidence that there's heavy private sector insurer involvement. It isn't necessarily reflected in, a, in this sort of slice because it's capturing who's initiating that ACO relationship. Um, so at this point, we want to just jump into our data a little bit, some of the uh, things that we're currently working with. One thing to also note in this discussion is that, uh, and this is probably the most obvious to a lot of people who have seen our reports up to now, is that geographically the distribution is uneven. Sometimes population accounts for that, but sometimes it doesn't. Take, for example, Massachusetts. It has half the population of Florida, but it has roughly the same count of ACOs. And if we were to dive in, uh, most on the call will probably be familiar with some of these organizations. But it's not just enough to know the number of ACOs in a given state. You really have to uh, drill down a little bit because you can have 20 ACOs in a state, and if all their population is on average 500 participants, that's a lot different than, say, a state like Massachusetts where their average um, population is in the thousands. 
So if you're sort of seeing the way we organize this, this reflects some of the work, some of the, the earlier initial type of stuff where you see uh, we have an ACO entity name, but then as you move right, uh, uh, you have the ACO type. If you move further right, um, these are some of the things that we're tracking and we feel are important. Um, and you have this distinction between the sponsoring entity and the different providers that are involved, which can be more than one provider, obviously. And you can also have the pair, which you'll see represented. So, Tom, let me just ask, because we looked at a little bit of data earlier where you denoted ACO types and ACO sponsors. Um, this, as we dive into the data here, I'm seeing both uh, listed in, in, the, in, the, uh, in the database. So hopefully those who are participating can see that um, there's a difference. Can you just delineate the difference again between an ACO sponsor and an ACO type? So an ACO sponsor is the organization that we feel has really taken the initiative to, to get this going, is essentially the leader, at least in the beginning. Uh, the, the ACO type describes more those who are involved, the different partners. Is it an insurer and a provider, or just two providers, and the insurer is really just the pair in that case? So if we can go back to the slide. slide. Um, uh, and we'll just we'll breeze through this uh, on account of uh, time. Uh, obviously, we're tracking the Pioneer program, the Shared Savings program, and something that has gotten a little bit less attention, but we really think is significant, and that is uh, state-level initiatives um, regarding Medicaid uh, ACO programs. And there's definitely activity there, as you can see from the map. Uh, there, uh, there's the, uh, the large majority of the United of the states are, are looking into something. But to sort of conclude this section, we, we definitely feel like um, uh, we've really bought into the, the uh, uh, Dartmouth Atl uh, the, the, the Atlas um, uh, and their way of organizing this in terms of HRs. If you, uh, this really gives you a better look that this is a market level movement. It, um, to me, it clearly dispels the notion that ACO growth is a population centered movement. I mean, if you, if you look at New York City, if you look at Chicago, you look at San Francisco, you don't see the intensity that you do in, let's say, Minnesota. Now, Southern California is a, is a population-dense area that happens to also be a dense ACO area, but there isn't a strong correlation between urban and, you know, urban uh, density and, and population growth. It's really a, a market-by-market market dynamic. And now that, that probably lends itself to me uh, throwing a question out that we've uh, received from one of our participants today. He asked, are the IPAs uh, that are taking the lead in forming ACOs, are they generally very large MD practices with many or, or most specialties involved? Can you say a little bit about the, you know, what these physician groups look like? Yeah, and it really depends on who the payer is. Aetna is largely focused on primary care at this point, so they will sort of virtually connect several offices and help them manage the, the, the population of, uh, or the health of a population. But right now, the metrics are mostly focused on primary care, uh, whereas when, uh, in, the CMS, in the CMS program or the Shared Savings program, um, they are also large organizations or, or, or large groups of uh, physicians either virtually connected or previously connected. And they are, because of the way that program is set up, they, they do include uh, specialties to a certain degree because of uh, the fact that it's global budgeting. Um, one thing, sort of going back a little bit to the, the market discussion, if we were to just look at Massachusetts and look at those numbers, um, a large part of why Massachusetts is such a hotbed uh, uh, is the fact that the state has decided to pass legislation that, that really moves people away from fee-for-service. And that has really opened doors for a dominant pair of Blue Cross Blue Shield in Massachusetts. And, and actually, the, 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 I'm reversing the order there. Blue Cross Blue Shield of Massachusetts um, implemented their alternative quality contract. They're seeing great results. They've had a lot of physician buy-in and a lot of physician participation. And so there really are several things going on there that has enabled so many organizations to join this movement. And Tom, this is Charlene. Um, if I could just make a quick comment. So I think what we've learned, in, if you, especially if you look at this map, so most people think, well, there are going to be lots of ACOs in areas where there's a lot of innovation in healthcare. And I don't think that's the driver 
as you can see from this, it, it, you know, places that you think are very innovative don't necessarily have the most um, number of ACOs. I think what we're finding is one, as Tom just mentioned, legislation um, and you know just the political environment in the state to build ACOs. But the second really important factor in building ACOs is the willingness of the providers to get together and actually form ACOs. So I think you know there's it's been interesting to find that you know that culture has to really exist for an ACO to be formed, and you know the pockets of ACO penetration I think lend itself to some degree to, to the ability of the physicians or the providers and the insurers and payers in that area to connect and design an ACO. Great, Charlene, thank you. Uh, that's a great point. And, um, and we appreciate uh, one of our participants using the chat feature and just indicating that you're a little bit more difficult to hear than we are. Um, it, it's not a line obstruction. Uh, and so thank you. And thanks for that comment, uh, Joanne. So uh, let's move to the next section here, which is really getting away from the sort of absolute numbers and, and how that breaks down and begin to look at how the payment arrangements and the, and the structures are forming on, on these organizations. So Tom, back to you. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, so if you were to break this down into uh, participation in terms of private programs, uh, or sorry, private contracts and public programs, this is what you see so far. You'll see that the majority at this point are, invo are involved in uh, private contracts, um, uh, a, a smaller uh, group, but still a very sizable group that are solely involved. And I should clarify that they're solely involved in private, solely involved in public, because there's a lot of overlap. Well, I shouldn't say a lot. There's a good amount of overlap, which you see represented by 29 that are in both a CMS program or a state level program and involved with a, with a private pair. Is it, is it fair to say that the 29 would probably be most of the pioneer ACOs because they were, I mean, for the most part, they were doing this before CMS engaged them in the pioneer demo. There's a few exceptions to that, but is, is, that, is that safe to say that most of that 29 would be pioneer and most of the 130, or at least a good share of the 130 might be some of the shared savings? participants? Absolutely. A lot of them were already on our radar when they came out. And, and something that um, we actually anticipate that this number, 29, is probably low. There's more overlap, and we're just not picking up on it. But that's something we're watching. Mm. Uh, something else that, uh, so getting into the payment arrangements, which we'll, we'll sort of show that has a lot to do with the structure. But sort of looking at it abstractly, this is from our uh, initial data sample of 60 ACO um, leaders interviewed, this is the, uh, these are the payment arrangements that we're seeing most commonly. Um, it's probably no surprise that shared savings is the predominant payment model uh, as it sort of introduces um, the, the model without uh, any risk at this point. But the majority of these contracts represent contracts that within just a year or two will require downside payment. But payers such as CMS, and uh, private payers are allowing for a time of transition. Um, but there was a good chunk of uh, uh, groups operating off of capitation representing uh, groups that had a lot of experience in this. So at this point, um, we, we felt like it would be helpful to, uh, again, jump into a little bit of our data and show why it's you have to understand this um, uh, in sort of a multi-dimensionally, um, just to understand the, just to know the payment arrangement uh, is is not to understand what is going on in that ACO in terms of risk and uh, cooperation. So uh, I'll turn the time over to uh, Paul, who's one of our research analysts, to walk us through um, uh, some of that structure. Thank you. What I've done here is I've created a view that um, that captures two of the ACOs that we're tracking. These are both ACOs that are in New Jersey. And um, the reason that I've captured these two is because they're kind of a interesting. They're kind of interesting, and there's some interesting overlap. So I'm going to start off by going into Optimus, and uh, we'll take a closer look at at Optimus Healthcare Partners. Okay, so if we go into Optimus, um, we can see we've got some information about it, and down here we have all of the providers that are involved. There. There are five different providers, and then we have the payers that are involved, and there are two different payers. We've got CMS and Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield. Um, when we come down and take a closer look at the arrangements, 
this is really interesting because if we look at Central Jersey, uh, we can see that they're in a shared savings um, arrangement with CMS. They're also in a pay for performance arrangement with Horizon. Uh, but if we look at Atlantic Health System, they're participating in this Optimus ACO, but only for the in the arrangement with Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield. And um, this is interesting because when we go and we look at Atlantic Health System, then we, uh, we can go down and look at the arrangements that they're involved in. And we see here that they actually do have um, a CMS arrangement, a shared savings CMS arrangement, but that's part of a different um, ACO where they're participating with different, um, with different partners. So here in the Atlantic Accountable Care Organization, we have Atlantic Health System and Valley Health System. So for some reason, they've chosen to, uh, to participate with Optimus in the Horizon uh, payment arrangement, but not in the CMS arrangement. Not all ACOs are this complex, but it's interesting that some of them uh, have that degree of complexity. Thanks, Paul. So <laughs> the, if any of you were able to hang with that, congratulations. Uh, the, the, it is a complex example, but it's not unrepresentative. It isn't everybody, but there are a lot of these type of arrangements where we're scratching our heads and saying, uh, how are these groups related and what do they do together? So for everyone's benefit, we thought we'd break it out a little bit abstractly and sort of show how we in our minds, even though we have it more complex in our system here, uh, it's complex because that's what we want to capture. But in terms of trying to understand this abstractly, it basically comes down to Optimus Healthcare Partners is an organization, basically an ACO entity set up by Atlantic Health System and others uh, to contract with different payers. And in this, and in, in their uh, arrangement with Horizon, uh, it involves Atlantic Health System. However, uh, for whatever reason, and, and, and these are these uh, uh, we we have friends in these organizations, by the way, and, and uh, we just felt like they were a, a neat example to share. We're excited about what they're doing, but for some reason, they decided that for the CMS Medicare Shared Savings Program uh, to to have two separate ACO arrangements. So if CMS is looking at these two organizations, they see two ACOs. But if Horizon is looking at them, they see one ACO. And again, this is not uh, infrequent, um, these type of arrangements. So um, if you have any questions, again, we want to remind everyone to use your chat feature to ask questions. And I think we have gotten a, yeah. a couple questions. Tom, I want to go to one that, that came in that I think is an interesting one. And, and, it, and it's the following. What's, you know, what's, the, what's the difference between ACO compensation and pay for performance of the past? Um, Charlene, it might it'd be great to get your perspective on this. I'll just start out by saying, you know, Pay for performance has been more of a categorical term describing payment arrangements where providers have incentives to meet certain quality uh, or, or efficiency benchmarks. I would say that one of the differences is that uh, pay for performance has, has uh, traditionally been focused on specific measures. And it could be, but it's not often population based. It's been more based on uh, you know how different uh, patients were treated, and then that's aggregated up, and you're trying to hit certain certain benchmark. Uh, ACO compensation really feels like it's aimed at. Uh, it's a lot. It, 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 it's potentially less easy to game or to study to the test because it's more population based. Now that doesn't mean it's global capitation. As Tom showed us earlier, there are some examples of global cap, but uh, even in the shared savings notion, it is transitioning providers to a mentality of um, population management and, uh, and the capability to manage the risk associated with those payment streams. Charlene, how would you respond to that question? Yeah, so I agree with everything you said, Andrew. What I would add is you, you could look at pay for performance as being a way for CMS to get away from fee-for-service payments. So they're still basically fee-for-service payments. However, there's now a penalty or a reward if you meet a particular quality measure. So I think you know if you look at there's it's not the same risk that an ACO is accepting. It really is more of a penalty and a bonus on a fee-for-service payment if you meet a measure. Thank you, um, Tom. Let's uh, let's advance. So um, why don't you keep going? We've got a, a little bit more data on 
some of the um, the aspect, the characteristics of the ACOs that that we're studying now. Again, this looking at the sourcing data here, just to remind our participants, this comes from the interviews that were conducted, um, and not from the census. Right, but we do think that it is representative uh, in, in many ways of the ACO movement as a whole, and that is, or in the ASO movement as a whole, and that is there there isn't predominantly large, small, or medium. There really is a wide range of uh, ACOs in terms of their population size. So not much to say say here other than you're dealing with different size of organizations. Um, and the same goes with the amount of physicians that are directly involved, uh, and this needs to be either affiliated or, or employed. Um, the slight majority is uh, under under 500, as you see here. And uh, we think that has, that has a lot of implications for what these organizations will look like and how they were op will operate. Great. Hey, as we pivot now to the final uh, section of content that we wanted to share with you today, I want to go back to another question. And Charlene, perhaps we could pose this to you. The question is, what is your expectation for ACO payment models over the next, it says, three, five, and ten years? Will we see much less fee-for-service and much more capitation or episodic payments? And does it depend on what CMS wants to do? So uh, I, I answer the last question first. Yes, I think it does depend on CMS wants to do, but to the degree providers are willing to do it. So I think the lesson learned in the ACO model from CMS is what they wanted in the beginning wasn't exactly what they could do. So they did have to make some, some changes to the ACO program to make it become a government program. But to, so to the degree they continue to stay voluntary, CMS knows what they want, but the market will definitely derive some of those ultimate CMS decisions over the next three, five, ten years. So I think, you know, there's no doubt that this administration clearly wants ACOs to be a new delivery system type. So I think to the degree they're successful, um, to the degree the market takes over that ACO in defining who they are, I think they will then um, those factors will, in fact, change the way reimbursement is made, and it will lead to whether they're called ACOs or just some more coordinated care models. I think it's a safe bet to say coordinated care will definitely take over health care in the next three, five, ten years. Whether it's an ACO model or something different, I think you know that's still up to that's up for grabs. But I think what's encouraging from this data is it's showing that the movement is go, is happening regardless of where CMS and the federal government are taking payers. So I think they will find a way to make these models work for them in the future. So I think it's CMS will they will they know where they want to go. Whether they'll be able to do that will really be driven by the market. One because it's a voluntary program. And two, because the market is actually taking over some of the ACO models and proving successful um, models that work, which CMS will then have to use as a model for them moving forward and designing healthcare. Mm. Charlene, one thing that I wanted to add to that, um, a lot of people, and, and we may, I think we thought this going into this, going into our research, and that was the end goal is capitation. Uh, one specific example in an interview with a, a pre-event system, who most would consider uh, a, po a poster boy of the ACO movement, uh, related to us that they do not see capitation as the end goal because specifically their reason was they don't want to be a system where you have to be a member for them to provide care for you. So they're very interested in bundled payments because they want the patient off the street, the patient driving by, to be able to come to that organization for more than just their complete care because they know how the payer world uh, is fragmented and, and that, that people come from all over. And so they very much see bundle payments as a part of their future, even though that, that's not necessarily capitation. Right. So Thank you. Oh, yes, Charlene, yes, please. Yeah, I'll just make a really quick comment about that. So if they wanted capitation, they would just tweak the managed care model. So I absolutely agree. It's not just about capitation. That isn't really. I mean, they could have done that much easier than create the ACO world where the beneficiaries are not members of a system. So I, I agree with that. Thank you, both of you.
Let's shift now to the, the third section here, which we're entitling Breakdown of ACO Competencies. And uh, again, we'll start at a conceptual level and then move down to some data. Through the course of our interviews and the census data that we're gathering, we've begun to compile what we see as the ingredients for success in an ACO. And there are seven of them that are listed here. And what we find is that those seven ingredients are not inherently possessed in any one entry or any one aspect of the healthcare system as we know it uh, historically. So uh, by way of example, uh, we have come to believe that a respected brand is an important part of success in an ACO environment. Uh, a hospital system generally possesses one of the best brands in the community. Uh, health plans are also well known in the community, though you know, depending on the, the situation, their brand may be tarnished. It may not be necessarily a brand that people, uh, that has a high, high brand equity to it. Physician, people often know the name of their doctor, but they don't very often know the name of the physician group or the affiliation of that group of doctors. Uh, you know, capital is necessary to make the investments to provide accountable care, and hospital systems and health plans both, both have capital um, to some degree, whereas physician groups uh, generally disperse capital back to the owners and don't possess that in the organization um, to the same degree. Aggregating lives is something that health plans do very well. Um, some physician groups have that competency. Hospital systems typically not. Uh, patient control or the ability to influence patient decisions you know, is something that physicians do extremely well. Uh, whether it's referring them to specialty care, whether it's prescribing their medication, or having them change a, 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 a lifestyle habit, you know, no, I, don't, I don't think physicians even believe that they're all that good at getting patients to change their lifestyle habits, but they certainly are closer to that patient control than a health plan would be, or much less a hospital uh, that, uh, whose contact uh, with the patient is only limited to the stay in the hospital. So you can sort of see how what we have are the need for combinations to come together to be able to um, to provide these ingredients. Um, you know, managing risk is something health plans have, have done well. Uh, a geographic footprint means care locations where uh, where patients can go, and then collaborative intelligence speaks to the need for not only HIT connectivity but a culture of communication that must exist. And while, while uh, HIT is pervasive across all three, um, what we hear as we talk to, to uh, ACOs is that the, 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 the products that are available to them today were not built with the, with the, with the accountable care needs in mind. And so there's a, a need there for, for uh, you know, improvement. Now, three of these have a close tie to care coordination, and that's really what we're talking about in this third section. But we're also talking about the structures that need to be in place for that care coordination. And the way that we will typically look at this in uh, Love It Partners is uh, it's sort of a, you think of the analogy of a general contractor that uh, is under contract to build a building. That, that is the prime contractor, and they assume global risk. They then will work with vendors uh, and subprime contractors in order to meet uh, all of the specs and complete the project on time. Some of those subprime vendors may be at risk. In other words, the electrician that they hire may have penalties or bonuses for finishing the work they do on time. At the bottom of the risk stack, you have vendors. And these are organizations that assume no risk, and they really fall into two buckets. Uh, some vendors are highly commoditized and therefore are lowest bidder type of vendors. You know, think of the rubber glove manufacturer uh, in, a, in a hospital setting, not bearing any risk for the performance of the hospital and competing on price. And then you have uh, a different type of fee-for-service vendor that's so highly specialized, they also need not bear full risk. The, the prime vendor will need to come to them for some service. Uh, think of a branded pharmaceutical that, is, uh, that doesn't have a generic equivalent or other branded competitors where, where they may not be involved in the risk situation um, but are not commoditized. So it's important to, to look at these levels of risk as we begin to look at the structure of the care continuum. And this is illustrative of 
the way models can work, and it's certainly not a comprehensive illustration because we're seeing a, a different, uh, you know, several different kinds of models. But by way of illustration, on the left of the slide, you see the complete ownership um, concept. And so you could think about a Kaiser where they have a hospital, they have physicians, they have a long-term care capability, mental health treatment, and there are no soft walls that exist between those. They are all within the ownership boundary of the organization. Uh, in, a, in the center of the slide, you see a partial affiliation model where, let's say in this case, it's the hospital that's the sponsor of the ACO, and they go out and form a relationship with a separately owned long-term care facility. They go form relationships with separately owned physicians. And both the long-term care and the physicians are part of their ACO. But when it comes to mental health services, they're operating as a vendor. They get paid fee-for-service when those services are needed, but they're not bearing any risk, and they're not part of uh, the ACO contract. And then a complete affiliation would be a virtual, a, a virtual um, kind of organization where each organization is owned separately, is independent, but for the purposes of a contract have come together to be that general contractor and bear the global risk, uh, usually under usually under a new organization uh, type. So um, having said that, let's, let's now move to the kinds of services that are often included in these accountable care arrangements. And this is an area where, where there's a lot of data to gather, uh, a lot of understanding that's emerging. But in essence, uh, you know, things like primary care and hospitalization, that's almost always included. You get down to the other end of the spectrum, and mental health, long-term care, retail pharmacy are sometimes not included in the, in, the, um, in the cost that's being measured and the benchmarks against which the ACO is measured. Um, Tom, may I just ask you to sort of walk us through some of the data that we've collected uh, on this movement? Yeah, thanks, Andrew. Again, this is information from the Levitt Partners and Class Joint Report that will be coming out in a few weeks. Um, uh, as you see here, the numbers kind of speak for themselves. Uh, if you're a care management, management coordinator uh, in any way, you have a pretty secure job, at least for the next few years, until they develop technology to replace you. Um, I say that last, uh, that, uh, I say that with a little bit of um, sarcasm because what we found in our report was that there was a large overlap um, in terms of the workforce that's being needed for these new models and the HIT meaning that uh, some organizations felt that this was a manual effort right now that would eventually be replaced by technology as it got better. We had a good amount of organizations that felt like they would go hand in hand and they would forever be hand in hand and so your job still is pretty secure. So we had a great question from Joanne who asked if we might expound on the HIT needs that we're hearing from the interviews. Being that we partnered with class, we uh, really got a ton of this, probably more than, than we could handle. It'll be in the report. Uh, uh, luckily, Class was just a great partner and, and really sp spoke well to this. But this is just a little, this is just a, 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 a glimpse into some of the data we were able to re receive. And we asked the question to these organizations, again, some on the lower end of the maturity spectrum, some on the high end, and almost everyone was in agreement that formal CIS integration uh, was either critical or very important. Uh, basically what that means is, is it important to have the financial and the health information together for purposes of population management. Um, and, and that little segment that you see where they said it was not important, when we pressed on that, they usually meant that they don't think that it's feasible. They don't think that this will ever be attainable, and that's why they put not important. Um, so in terms of specific population management software, um, these are some of the results. Most often, the EMR vendor, I shouldn't say most often, but very frequently, uh, these organizations are bootstrapping their EMR vendor. And uh, for the most part, we found that they were not happy with, uh, with what they were using. They just kind of had to give with, uh, with what they had. Um, uh, very commonly as well was the, this custom um, uh, program that they, you know, it was usually homegrown and uh, the quality, the sort of rankings we got on those were very high because they developed them in-house and it was specifically to what their needs were. Now the biggest chunk was really telling to us 
with that there were, uh, in, in large part, um, there was no consensus on the or the different companies that were providing population management software. Uh, other means that they were all over the place. Um, you had a lot of organizations using business software and combining that with their financial software to sort of create something, uh, a little bit of a monster that at least helped them deal somewhat with their problem. But the satisfaction uh, rankings on those uh, that, that are included in the class report were very low, to be honest. Uh, so that's uh, just um, uh, probably the only numbers that we'll share at this point uh, in terms of specific vendors in this space. Great. Tom, Tom thank you. So let me just um, go to a, a quick question um, and then um, want to just wrap up with a couple of key points here. We had a question come in about how would you expect the evolution of ACOs to impact marketing to commercial payers? Uh, in parentheses, from the perspective of a pharma manufacturer. So, how how you know how does the pharma marketing equation with commercial payers, formulary access, formulary status, uh, be changed by the evolution of ACOs? At least that's how I'm interpreting this question. It's a great one, and it's something that we're we're thinking a lot about. Um, and it in, in in short, what we feel is that in the future, many of the uh, chronic disease management and care management decisions will be you know, more locust with providers and as such will be most interested in what pharma manufacturers can do to help them manage that chronic disease. So in the early going, it doesn't necessarily mean that formularies are determined by ACOs, but the door certainly seems open to that, to that in the longer term. Um, let me just say in closing a couple of things that based on some comments coming in in the chat bar, it, it looks like uh, some people are asking about when the KLAS LP report will be available. We expect that to be out in the next two weeks and it can be uh, accessed, it can be purchased through the KLASresearch.com website. Um, it includes uh, some of the data you've seen today and, and a whole bunch of, of, of other insights. Uh, we uh, you can come to us and we can help you get there as an alternative, um, but that's the answer to that question. Secondly, the data set that we've um, gone into a couple of times to get today is something that is based on census data. Uh, we do, we, that information comes from interviews, it comes from other secondary research. We share insights back with providers that we interview, with ACOs that we interview. Those relationships to us are precious. We don't share all the information from those interviews. But that is uh, something that we do share with clients in order to help them get a sense of this movement. And uh, Tom, we appreciate you taking us through that, that data set today. So um, I'd like to uh, thank you uh, for, for joining us today. Um, there are some great questions regarding wellness, um, med device, among others, that we'll make sure to follow up with you on in attempt of, if we didn't have a chance to get, those, get to those today. But thank you for attending the webinar. We appreciate your interest. Uh, you will uh, likely be getting a survey from us, a follow-up survey, where if you have any feed additional feedback,